Well, thank you very much. Welcome once again to Where Are They Now? And uh, as previewed, we're going to get down to Pumpin' Away, Florida. And, and we're going to bring in a guy, don't worry, kids, my brother Chris, because every time we have questions about NASCAR, uh, we need to go that direction. But let's get all the bad news out of the way first and tell me you're looking out on the beach and how hot was it down there today? Oh, it was uh, it was rather chilly. It was about uh, oh mid 80s and uh, oh. very high humidity. So uh, it was it was a little tough to take. But seriously, uh, yeah, was, yeah, we obviously we feel for you all out there. I mean, uh, having grown up in New Jersey, the the cold weather is uh, not a friend anymore. So uh, I can only imagine what everybody's going through out there in Oklahoma and Texas specifically. Yeah, we we uh, got away from the East Coast, so we wouldn't have to have to handle this anymore. Uh, so we we'll just have to kind of live with it for a couple more days, and maybe we'll get on the other side of it. Hey, Chris, I want to ask you a couple of things. We're going to get into the Daytona 500, but uh, obviously not your usual race, to say the least, in length and as far as how long it took to complete it, what went on within the race, starting it, ending it. Uh, good for the sport to have somebody like Michael McDowell win the thing. Oh, it's unbelievable. You know, it's funny you're talking about uh, sports betting before Michael McDowell went off 100 to 1 to win the race. So that ought to tell you uh, how unexpected his victory was. Um, And, you know, super speedway racing lends to that, Tom. Uh, Daytona, Talladega specifically. Uh, The, 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 shall we say, the underdog can rise up and and slay the, the big boys. Uh, and, and in this case, Michael McDowell did. Um, you know, he's one of probably three drivers over the last five or six years that have done that at Daytona. And it's always good for the sport. You know, you know, you have that that core group of, of drivers that are seemingly winning every race um, on the schedule. And so to have somebody like Michael McDowell, who has never won a Cup race before, uh, you know, come home with the the hardware at the end that was a that was a, a big thing for for not only his career but certainly for NASCAR as a sport. Let's go back to that cop maybe you just made about uh, you know the core group of people who seem to win all the time. But for the sport though, isn't it better to have the winners that win all the time? And don't you have to have some villains in that group too for everybody to kind of hitch their wagon to? Well, I, you know, it's funny. I could I can equate uh, that to when I was involved with NHRA drag racing and top field driver Tony Schumacher, who drove the U.S. Army top field dragster. He uh, he had won, I'm, I'm trying to remember now, it was so many in a row, like six, six straight uh, world championships. And he, in effect, became the villain because uh, he had, everybody wanted to knock him off at any given race and certainly for the championship. So... Yes, I think it's uh, to have somebody wearing the white hat, somebody wearing the black hat, is is, is very good for the sport. And um, you know, there, there's a there's a number of those drivers still competing on the NASCAR Cup circuit. Uh, Kyle Busch comes to mind. Uh, he has you either love the guy or you hate the guy. So um, you know, that, it is good for the sport to have a mix of drivers. But again, uh, understanding that it is excellent for the sport and ratings to have somebody uh, like Michael McDowell uh, rise up like he did. How in the world can, uh, we call them teammates, I guess, uh, uh, get in each other's way, knock each other out? Uh, is it competitive value of the race takeover? Or, you know, sometimes uh, is there kind of brother-in-law ball here that we're, we're both on the same team, we're not going to get each other's way and take each other out in the final lap? Well, I think it's, um, you know, you're going to work as teammates in in races like Daytona 500. You're going to work as teammates for a great portion of the race because there's drafting involved, et cetera. But once it gets down to the final, you know, 10 laps or so, it's basically, uh, you know, you're on your own uh, because everybody wants the big paycheck uh, and everybody wants to to become a, a Daytona 500 champion if you haven't won already. In Denny Hamlin's case, uh, uh, you know, he had was going for three in a row. He didn't quite make it, uh, finished in the top five. But, uh, you know, the, the, to see what happened in the in that last lap, 
uh, Michael McDowell was the smart driver in that case. He waited for the uh, the hole to open and he shot shot for it, and uh, he ended up uh, getting the checkered flag, and that was uh, a big feather in his cap. Talk about Logano Kozlowski. Uh, uh, does that carry over? Hey, yes, teammates, but as you just mentioned, they want to win. But you know, what what about something like that? Does that carry over from from once to come, or do they just get over? Well, uh, let's put it this way. As teammates, they've had their issues in the past, Keselowski and Logano. And uh, so uh, can it carry over? Absolutely. In fact, this weekend they're still at Daytona, but they'll be on the road course uh, on Sunday. And that has a tendency to uh, uh, lend to beating and banging uh, for passing purposes. So uh, you don't know if, uh, you know, subconsciously Keselowski – might have a, uh, a thought to, uh, shall we say, turning Logano on a particular turn uh, on the road course to, if it means uh, the difference between winning and losing. Hey, is Larson all the way back now from that uh, year in exile, if you will, the race of flirt? Are you talking about Kyle Larson? Is yeah. You're yeah, he, he's back. Um, he's back with Hendrick, actually, which is a terrific organization. Um, and and he's very fortunate to be have another opportunity given what he uh, what he went through. Uh, you know, he's basically was in exile for the the better part of a season, and um, so to, to have an opportunity to come back and come back with such a uh, a credible organization as Hendrick, uh, you know, this is this is a, one of those last chance opportunities, and he better take advantage of it at, uh, while he can. Patrick's with us today as well, and Patrick's kind of zoning in on some of this NASCAR talk. Yeah, I. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned the the Kyle Larson thing there, um, because we've seen at times, whether it be athletes or, or people in the business, that uh, something maybe not of that level happens, maybe even a little less, and it seems like they might not get a second chance. So I think it's pretty interesting that he is getting, and it's, it's probably you know a good thing that he is getting a second chance in terms to make things right. You know, we heard we he had been to, to different groups and things like that, different uh, therapy sessions, support groups, all that stuff to get right. Um, but is is that maybe uh, Chris like a a starting point for for some forgiveness for things like that? I mean, I know it's uh you know racial things. Obviously, it's 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 one thing, and then of course you know I bring back the the Tom Brenneman stuff that happened when he uh, had the the gay slur come on, uh, the homophobic slur come on air there uh, this past season as well, and uh, he's basically been exiled. So is this maybe like a step forward for sports world uh, people and of, of all races, of all kinds, to maybe come together and say, hey, look, guys make mistakes. Let's see if we can't, uh, can't get them educated and go about it again. Well, I think everybody inherently likes a comeback story, right? So um, and in Larson's case, you know, he has gone through – the um, treatment, quote unquote, that he's had to go through uh, to to make the, to make this comeback. And NASCAR, I can tell you, most assuredly, uh, policed that in every which way uh, before they would allow him to uh, come back and compete. So um, you know, it wasn't a it wasn't a, a course of Hendrick just uh, calling Larson and say come back. It had to go through the proper channels. So, yes, to answer your question, I I think uh, this is probably initial step. You know, he's going to be watched and scrutinized uh, uh, off the track and uh, and, and make sure he's doing the right things. Otherwise, uh, you know, he's going to be out of there as quickly as he came back. Good to have Michael Jordan involved uh, uh, with the Bubba Wallace racing story that went into this. I think it's a great, uh, great opportunity for – other athletes, professional athletes, to get involved uh, in the sport, you know, and other other prominent folks. Uh, you know, you probably saw Pitbull all over the Daytona 500 uh, telecast. Uh, you know, he's involved with the team, uh, albeit a, probably a less uh, uh, less budget team. But you know, it's good to see other uh, other folks getting involved, and uh, you know, we'll we'll see where it shakes out. You know, and it's. Getting involved with NASCAR is not the cheapest proposition. I grant you, Michael Jordan is probably a made of money at this point, but um, you know he, he's going to have to see some results too to to make it worth his while. You know, Jordan is still a competitor at heart, so I'm sure he's expecting uh, uh, some wins and some consistent top five, top ten finishes to make this uh, a viable 
uh, is, business alternative. Is Joe Gibbs the, uh, I guess, success story in this area that we're talking about, people jumping into the sport? Well, I mean, yeah, he, he's probably, uh, you know, the, the one everybody aspires to, uh, to be uh, from somebody coming in from the outside, shall we say. Um, but you know he has he has roots uh, deeply embedded in the sport now, and you know if if anybody's going to look at a business plan, certainly that's the one you want to look at because he's had had tremendous success and championships and victories all over the place. So yeah, I, I think he's the guy that everybody wants to mimic, uh, you know, going forward. Patrick has some uh, questions about uh, viewership, and he brought up a couple of good points here this afternoon. Yeah, I saw, uh, you'll have to remind me, Chris, for sure, but I saw that there were, uh, I think it was a record number, uh, low viewership for the for the Daytona 500. But, of course, I'm sure some of that has to do with the fact that it was delayed for like five hours plus. Oh, and that, and that in fact, is the case. I mean, you're talking about a race that that uh, restarted at 9 o'clock Eastern time and didn't end until after midnight. So, uh, and there are folks that have to, to go to work and, uh you know, I guess there's some kids that have to go to school uh, if there's that that's still a, a viable thing uh, versus virtual. But, uh, you know, so you, you're going to lose viewership as time goes on uh, because of that. I think you would have had big numbers, frankly, if it uh, went from start to finish during the uh, four hour window in the afternoon. Where is this sport, in your opinion, Chris? Uh, it has its highs, it has its lows. Is it, I mean, it, what was it, six, seven, eight years ago? I mean, it was riding pretty high in all the areas. Check the box. Uh, where is it now? Well, I tell you, what, what's happening now, Tom, is the fans are are making their voices heard a lot more than probably. Well, let's put it this way. Let me rephrase that. NASCAR is listening to, to the fans a lot more than they ever have. Uh, and, and, and to that effect, they're racing – a part of it has become the, the critical component. It's not just all about the, the idolization of the drivers. It's uh, people, the fans want to see great racing. That's the bottom line. And in fact, uh, this year NASCAR has reacted to that and added seven road course races in response to the fans' uh, desire to see better racing. So the reality is, um, he, you know, NASCAR has to. Uh, look at, at what's going on, the competitiveness on the track, and use that as a basis for uh, uh, keeping the sport popular. Attendance going to go up, down, stay the same? Where are we going here? Well, I mean, that's all pandemic-related, needless to say, still. Uh, Daytona um, has uh, had 30,000, I think, that were allowed. Uh, you know, and that place uh, completely... Uh, you know, when it's sold out, it's over a hundred thousand. So they're taking it. You know, they're taking a financial hit, as are a lot of sports teams and sports organizations. But uh, um, you know, we'll have to see going forward. Uh, you know, where where uh, what the tracks are and what they're going to allow attendance wise. But uh, they're they're taking a financial hit. There's no question. You and I have talked about this seemingly endlessly when we talk racing and its sponsorships and you now the lack of everybody having excess money, maybe the sponsorship is down, but this is a great story locally here because McDowell's uh, primary sponsor was Love Travel Stop in Oklahoma City. You know, they're, they're having a good time with this. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's certainly, it's it's great to see uh, other sponsors get the, the recognition that they, that they are so uh, desiring. Um, and certainly uh, McDowell winning that race at Daytona, you know, all you saw were, uh, you know, were those sponsor logos on his driver's suit and on the car. So, um, no, it's great to see, uh, you know, again, it, it's the diversification of, of, of the uh, competitors and who's winning and who isn't. And, uh, you know, in fact, you even have a driver who's, uh, and I, I really hesitate to say this because of where he's uh, from, but he's from Norman. There's a driver competing in the, in the, uh, in the NASCAR Cup circuit. So, um, you, you have a lot of drivers come from all over the place and representing various uh, parts of the country, which is which is nice because it used to be the good old sport from from the deep south. Is it a, a push 
maybe to make drivers more, for lack of a better word, human than they were back in the day when people want to get to know these guys and say, hey, they're kind of like me, or is that just not part and parcel of the, of the approach? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I it's, again, it, it's a lot more Madison Avenue than it's ever been, <laughs> um, if that's what you're, you're referencing. Um, you know, again, with the corporate – uh, backing of teams, the corporate backing of drivers. Uh, you know, it's it's not the uh, the guys from from uh, North Carolina anymore. So, uh, yeah, and and to that effect, there is a lot more humanization, I think, of of the drivers because of that, because they have to be a little more uh, uh, keen on on uh, taking care of their sponsor obligation. Let's turn to a uh, warm weather sport here. I know Patrick can't wait on this because we're big baseball guys, but. I told him that, uh, you know, in the midst of your busy schedule, you probably already have, like, seven or eight spring training games already mapped out that you're going to attend, right? Well, interesting that you bring that up because my wife, Tara, and I uh, have just been discussing uh, where we want to go, uh, you know. Uh, you know, with the new the new uh, spring training format, a lot of the East Coast teams, they, they're only going to play each other, and that's five of them uh, – uh, you know, the Marlins, the Mets, the the uh, Nationals, the Astros. And uh, so, you know, they're they're going to be playing each other in a sort of a round robin through the month of March. So we just have to decide where we want to go. But I think our first game is going to be the Mets and the Astros on March 6th up in West Palm Beach. So that will be kind of interesting to see uh, our, our, our lovely team and see how they do. Well, that's, that's Patrick's favorite team, the Astros. I really, I really enjoy uh, everything about them. Yeah, uh, the, as as Tom knows, since the cheating scandal, I've, I've had a little bit of issue with everything that Houston decides to do out there, Chris. Of course, they. Uh, everybody has that issue, you know. Uh, but uh, you know, truth be told, uh, you know, back to Tom's question, spring training is something to behold. If you, if, you know, if anybody's ever gets a chance to get down here in normal times, I might add, uh, when the the attendance is not limited. Um, it's an experience that uh, you know people should have one time in their lives because uh, it's smaller stadiums. You get a chance to to mix with the the players a little bit. It's a, it's a lot of fun. So, not to mention the weather, it's a lot better than what it is out there right now. That's for sure. <laughs> Where do you see Cobb fitting into this thing? You going to see Cobb down there? Well, I mean, uh, allegedly uh, Trey's going to be down here. Um, you know, when the minor league camps open up on April 1st, the last I connected with him. So, um, you know, he's he's got a challenge in front of him. I'm sure he's healthy now, but, you know, he's missed out on two two seasons in the Mets organization, uh, one with the arm trouble and then uh, with the minor league shutting down in, in, in its entirety last year. So um, so he's going to come out. He's going to have to come out with a, with a bang and uh, impress the, the Mets organization uh, if he's going to go anywhere in a short amount of time. No, Zach has probably turned the radio off by now because he's an Atlanta guy. But, you know, I, I think even Pat, when we picked our, our team, at least early on division-wise, I think we threw the Mets there as kind of a, a contender, if you will, in the East. What, how do you see it? Is Lindor going to make all that much difference? Well, I, you know, uh, you and I have had this conversation every year. You know, we always have high hopes, and uh, with, whether with the uh, additional players that they get, but uh, you know, I, 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 I'm the glass half empty guy with the Mets. Uh, you know, I always fear uh, that they're going to just fall on their faces, and and I want to be pleasantly surprised when they don't. So, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't be an optimist, Tom. Sorry. <laughs> We've been down that road too many times to be an honest. You got that right. You got it that isn't right. like Wheeler. I mean, with his cards, he, he can't go wrong with cards every time. Hey, uh, yeah. Arenado joining, that. I mean, they're going to win the World Series this year. I mean, it, was, it was the last piece they needed, right? So it, it's pretty much how it is now. I wouldn't count on that. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Let's uh, see what happens. I can time dream. Okay, that's all that matters. Time will tell. We can always dream. Yes. Well, and that's the beautiful part about spring training. Uh, and we've had a couple of guys on Teal, and we've had uh, Wolf on, and uh, I think we had uh, we know we had Cobb on. Uh, I mean, they're all confident the bit to get down there and start start work. Uh, after last year, which was just a total, uh, it's just a total mess because there was no minor league, no alternate training side, sixty games. What was your take on that? And I hate to be so critical, but what was your take on that gimmicky year that we just went through? 
year or last year? Well, I mean, I, you know, I felt good uh, in the sense that, you know, it was a sprint. It wasn't a marathon. So that that in, in, in inherently makes it more exciting. Um, you know, 162-game schedules, you know, it, it can get a little uh, monotonous. But so that 60-game sprint was kind of cool for a change. And I actually did like the DH. I embraced that. I'm sorry they're not bringing that back. Um, the universal DH, but oh, um, I, Wheeler, <laughs> I don't. Did you pay him all for what? Oh, Chris no. just became my favorite no. guy. I mean, it, well, the the DH needs to be in the league universal for the 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 end of time. I mean, that that's awesome. I'm not I'm not a purist like my brother is, but that's right, uh, you know. But I, I think uh, there are some of the rules they you know bringing back the seven inning double headers, um, you know, and the guy you know starting from second base. Uh, you know, in the extra innings. I, I think it's kind of cool. You know, baseball, listen, baseball is a boring game, let's be honest. And, uh, you know, you got to do something to spice it up and, and, and also increase the uh, viewership for the national games. And, um, you know, I think this kind of thing can help that uh, go a long way. Before we get out of here with you, uh, you know, this, back in the day when Gary Ward, you heard Gary on the, on the opening, uh, Oklahoma State, your school, would take that uh, long trip to Florida and Texas and play about 15 games of the season and get out of the winter weather and all that. Obviously, Oklahoma State's not coming to uh, to Florida. They're going to Texas. But OSU, I mean, they're in a good position this year with the guys at back to really make a run at that Big 12 title. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. And, you know, I'd love to get out uh, if the uh... – if it all comes to pass to see the, the new stadium and and see the the, the uh, present day Cowboys, uh, you know, and uh, you know, I think they have a good opportunity to to make some uh, make some hay this year in the Big Twelve and maybe uh, make a run at Omaha again. Uh, everybody wants to. Everybody asks what the goal is every year, right? So down here, you get the Hurricanes. You hear nothing, uh, everything about the Hurricanes and everything about UF and um, you know, FAU has a pretty good program, but. Uh, uh, I'm kind of getting tired of hearing about those guys. I'm ready to hear about the the, uh, the OSU Cowboys, and I guess the season starts uh, sooner than later if the weather would ever break. It actually starts Friday in Huntsville, Texas, hopefully, knocking on wood against Sam Houston. Uh, last thing uh, with OSU, though, uh, you you grew up pretty much around Reynolds Stadium, and, and you just mentioned you can't wait to see the new one. I've been there, and it, it, is, it is breathtaking. And, and for me to say that, you know it has to be spectacular because I'm not a big breathtaking guy. But uh, what, what did you feel? I mean, you, you spent a lot of hours at Reynolds Stadium, and now I don't even know what they're going to do with it. I mean, but it's empty. Well, a little melancholy to know that uh, it may not be there uh, in the foreseeable future. But, you know, you have to remember, I've, I've come, uh, it's been a tiered approach for me. I uh, was in the old rickety uh, wooden stadium before Reynolds Stadium covering games for the Ocali. So, uh, uh, you know, I've seen, the, I've seen the evolution of baseball uh, stadiums on the co- college level. And, you know, Reynolds was the crown jewel. Uh, you know, uh, Alley P was the – that was it, man. That was everybody's uh, goal to play in Alley P. But, uh, you know, I'll be a little melancholy when, that, uh, when they decide what they're going to do with it, which I don't think is going to be a, a very good thing. <laughs> so uh, When you uh, played one year at Kansas – you can't tell me their field was much. They didn't have anything at all, did they? No, that was a glorified high school field, really. So, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, so that's, but the stadiums, you know, these days are, are meant to be recruiting tools and, and understandably so, and, and uh, also try to attract some of the professional players that come back and train and, and be an influence on the current crop. So uh, I, I get where that's going and, you know, maybe it'll be a revenue uh, boost to to the athletic department one day as well. Well, next time something pops up in the racing world, these guys will probably get a hold of you. We know where to go. We need an answer for the uh, race, sir. And I'll let you, I'll let you go. I know you have to. You probably have to get the air conditioner started early, so you don't. I, it cold. Actually, I have to turn it down because it's pretty cold right now in the <laughs> in the condo. So. <laughs> Sorry, guys. You are so bad. <laughs> But, uh, hey, I hope you have to sweat extra tomorrow in the heat and humidity. Well, we'll do that. And I uh, appreciate you guys having me on. And, uh, you know, we'll we'll, see, we'll be on again and follow the NASCAR world, uh, you know, as, as the NASCAR world turns. <laughs> yeah, 
these guys know your number, so they'll get a hold of you anytime that's happening. I appreciate it, man. Say hello to Tar for me, and uh, we'll talk to him. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, Bob. That is uh, the one and only Chris Dorado, who has opinions on a lot of stuff. And being an Oklahoma State guy, being an old timer, he can he can look back on a lot of old things too. So, uh, but I like the approach. So I don't break. I know he can't wait to get out here as well. And that'll put for this uh, week. Where are they now? Appreciate Patrick uh, kind of babysitting throughout all this as we stayed at home, worked out of the old office here, uh, and uh, we'll we'll maybe we'll get a cross paths here eventually in that in that studio here. Soon.